Well, this morning, our talk title is Let's Get Metaphysical. And it is, as you can imagine, the metaphysics of science of mind. And so today we are using our science of mind symbol to speak, <coughs> and that is the next part in the book. We are getting very near the end of the book, but this is right there near the end. And so the metaphysical charts at the end of the book are actually teaching symbols that we use in classes. They help to inform and help people understand the way life works. And that is a key to this teaching. Understanding how life works allows us to work life in the way that we desire. And so I'd like to point out that it really is a very basic structure. It really is a simple explanation. And at the same time, it can be seen as being very complex, especially when we're facing a challenge, something that we're working to overcome. And we get to the point where we remember, oh, yeah, I remember the way life works. So who needs to make the change? Nobody and nothing outside me. Oh, bummer. It's me. It's always me. Although the metaphysical symbol is um, for science of mind and developed by Ernest Holmes, it does cross many religions and spiritual traditions because it incorporates the idea of the nature, the nature of God, the nature of life, the nature of reality, that being our, each and every one of us, natural state of being. And I think sometimes we get so caught up in the world that we forget who we are and what we're here to do. It is scientifically provable by each individual, and it is well demonstrated in the larger life, the universal energy that God is. Ernest Holmes wrote, the eternal cycles of life in motion fulfill my faith. So let's begin with the idea that our personal relationship with the Creator always helps us achieve a greater understanding. It helps us to live with tolerance, acceptance, and respect for what appear to be the many differences in human form for us in life. And they, it helps us to understand this as we get closer and closer and spend more time talking within to God and living as though we truly are the loving, peaceful, joyful presence of the One. And that is true because we begin to understand that oneness. We begin to understand that there truly is only one life. There is only one of us. This song we just sang, in your eyes, when I look into you, when I speak to you, if I see me, I'm going to speak to you with love and gentleness <coughs> and kindness. And I'm not talking about enabling. I'm talking about love. And as we become more clear with the idea of one life and living in it, we begin to understand that if I really truly do believe that there is only one life, then out of necessity I am of that. And I am that now, regardless of how I'm showing up or what I personally believe about anything about myself, I am that. And that is true not only for this given moment, but throughout eternity. Will you put the first slide up? Oh, you did already. No, oh, thank you, sir. So, oh, it doesn't show the colors as beautifully as it is in real life. In reality, this is all blues and purples around there, and it's really, really pretty. It looks kind of dark in this one. But I have borrowed um, the ideas from um, people who, were taught, who taught and ministered together in Asheville, North Carolina, Barbara and John Waterhouse, because um, they mentored us quite frequently. 
um, along our path because they did ministry together and they gave us some very wise hints as to how to do ministry together and keep it strong. And so I often look at what ideas they're sharing because they are incredible metaphysicians. So the circle, whether here or here, in any of our symbols, represents the entirety of infinite spirit with no beginning and no end. And then the area, this top area, represents the self-conscious mind of spirit from which all thought originates. In quantum physics, we would call that the ground of all being, consciousness. The top line across represents spirit expressing, I'm sorry, the line coming down rec represents spirit expressing into form. And that is into physical form. And the area in the center part represents the spiritual law, which we've been talking about a lot recently, how law works. And that spiritual law in the center is what consciousness moves as through. And it receives the impress of the thought placed into it and manifests them into physical form. The area at the bottom represents the physical form. It represents you and me, all of creation. And then the line that is moving upward on what some people call the V, oftentimes new people will come in and say, what is your V all about? Well, it's a long story. Take a class, which by the way, we do have a class coming up, <laughs> Basics of Science of Mind. Um, that last one represents spirit experiencing its creation. Now you often hear us say God experiences through you. That is what that's representing. It's representing spirit, which is all that is, experiencing us. And it ascends upward as the resulting experience, the result. The curve at the top of it represents the ongoing creative process, meaning the continuation of the process over and over and over, and the only way that it will change is if we place a new thought into it. That is often talked about, you'll hear us say, open at the top. And open at the top indicates that we are open, at, open to infinite possibilities, the realm of possibilities, all that God is. Well, I brought, hope you brought your thinking caps today, because this is going to be um, Science of Mind 101 in terms of the uh, studying the symbol. Symbols are valuable to us because they allow us to look at life from a different perspective and a different way. And so rather than just hearing words, sometimes when you put things into symbols, it helps us to maybe understand directions and ideas and definitions. And so um, this is quite often referred to as the teaching tool in Science of Mind. So you're being taught today. I was going to bring my pocket protector, but I don't have a pocket today. So, <laughs> to be Mr. Teacher today, but, well, here we go. Um, I'm going to break it down a little bit, and it, once again, if you want to know more about it, come to the class on the 21st, and we'll talk, oh, on 21st of October, isn't it? September. September, September, it's always very important. Lunch provided. Yes, so plan to be here, be a part of that, and to get into it so you can actually ask questions. As if there will be any questions after today. <laughs> These are the charts as uh, Ernest Holmes describes them, and he broke it down in many different ways. What's really kind of challenging about it is this represents the triune nature of, of man and of, of God and of the universe, and you know there are three different sections. And so trying to understand the triune nature takes three different perspectives. And so we, we look at it in a lot of different ways to try to understand exactly how it works. So I'm going to kind of break it down a little bit with using a lot of words to understand that in terms of definition. Just a few. Just a few. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to attempt to talk about every single one of them. <laughs> Generally speaking, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down the center, down the center, then I go to the left, 
and then I'll go to the right in each one of the sections. The first, the first section is, this chart, by the way, uh, is called the universal chart. It shows the universe as a trinity of being. The upper section designates those attributes of spirit which are self-conscious. The middle section shows the subconscious aspect of law, and the lower section shows the effect of spirit working through the medium of universal mind. So as Denver says, what happens when you have the possibilities, then the medium through which it flows the creative uh, process, and then becomes form at the bottom, or body. So we have what we call spirit, soul, and body. So Tom, starting at the top, we have the, the realm of spirit. The absolute means all that is, everything that is. It's the great I am. So anything, every time you say, I am this or I am that, where you are relating with that which is all that is. And so therefore you are claiming in your life that to be of you. So it's the conscious mind. It's conscious in the mind of God because God is consciousness and God is the only, uh, since it is all that is, the only essence that can possibly um, understand infinity and eternity, the realm of all that is. Um, its purposefulness means that it's intentional. It's the divine urge to express. It actually means to express itself into the universe. Self-propelling and self-existence mean that it actually follows through with that intention of expressing itself in the universe. It propels itself into the physical realm and it also expresses itself in a, and it creates a uh, knowing of its existence in a different form. These terms of volition, life, truth, power, choice, and will are a little bit challenging because quite often we don't necessarily think of God as having choice, but it does in a, in a certain way. The volition means the act of independence, or in, to act independently, because it is the one essence of all that is, and so therefore it cannot work in cooperation with anything else because there is nothing else, and so it's an independent energy. Um, life, we all know that God is life, we all know that God is truth, that God is the power of the universe. Choice is a little bit of a challenge, but choice means that it's like the will, that's climb, combined with the word will, meaning that it's God. The, uh, the Father's good will to give, and so the kingdom. Free spirit, it cannot be bound. Since God is all that is, it cannot be bound, so therefore it must be free. Peace and poise also represent the idea that if there's nothing that opposes it, it must always be at peace. It must always be a poise, it must always be at rest. There's nothing to work against it. The word represents self-contemplation. Quite often talk about the self-contemplation of God and the word being form actually in the Bible also but we're here we're talking about self-contemplation and the perfect logos is that idea of the logic and also um, the word coming into form and so it's uh, self-contemplation of God being expressed into the universe now we go to the left side it says only all that's kind of a contradicting idea, isn't it? It's only this, but it's all of that. Because God is the only one, so therefore it's the only thing that is, but it is also all that is. So it seems like a contradicting statement, but it's not really. It knows no other, because if it is all that is, there is no other. So there is nothing else to know. It's the father-mother God. It's not uh, binary. It's not binary? Is that the I don't know. I'm not exactly sure what all those terminologies mean, but it is um, it is not sexually oriented. It is it is just um, it is one neutral. essence. Neutral. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we're going to talk about neutral later, but um, it's unity and the macrocosm. It is all that is, and it is only one. Uh, it's the great house in the Bible. It says, "In the, my Father's kingdom are many mansions." That's what it means. It, unity and multiplicity. In my Father's house, the one place, there are many ideas, many expressions to be lived through. It's masculine, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, the masculine and the feminine uh, um, effect, um, actress, or the word I'm looking for, attributes of God, and the idea that the realm of possibility is masculine, and it is placed into the feminine, which is subjectivity, the law, and then it produces 
form for the body. And so we understand that idea. And it's always active because God is life, and so therefore life is always active. Now we go to the right side. Personalness represents the idea that God is all that is, and God is the one person. Quite often you hear that terminology, one person. So it's talking about personalness in that respect. It's the conscious idea. It's the realm of possibilities. We choose one idea from the realm of infinite possibilities. We insert it into the law and let it become manifest. It's changeless because if God is all that is, what's going to change into? There is nothing else. So therefore, it can't change into something when it's already that. Omniscience means all, all wisdom, all knowledge. Omnipotence is all powerful, and omnipresence is everywhere. And so it's, it's all powerful, all knowing, and everywhere. And it reasons deductively only. That's kind of a challenge. When you start studying science of mind and getting into inductive and deductive reasoning, it's kind of a challenge. But look at it this way. Inductive reasoning requires that we make a choice, that we have an opinion, that we choose from one thing or another. And deductive reasoning is, is we have a list of criteria and that makes sense. And so therefore, um, God looks at things deductively. God does not make choices from one thing to the other because one thing would be more valuable than another. And if God is ever present, um, then there can't be some place that is more important than another or the entire structure would seem to collapse. So therefore, God only thinks deductively. We move down into the soul. The soul is the creative medium. It's where all the work takes place. We, re we release ideas and thoughts into the, the uh, subjective law and it responds accordingly. It's the creative medium. It's subjective and unchoosing. It doesn't make any choices. It doesn't decide, well, I'm going to give you this or not give you that. This will become the idea we don't pray to God to change the mind of God. We, we pray to God to change our own uh, uh, ability to receive. And so, therefore, it is unchoosing. It's also the subconscious mind. It's those, those ideas that are in the back of our mind. It's immaterial because it has not come into form yet. Um, the illusion of the mind, that's a tricky one. Plotinus says, nature is the great no thing, yet it is not exactly nothing. Holmes says of that, um, its, its business is to receive the forms of thought within the spirit. It's, I'm sorry, let me start over. It's, its business is to receive the forms of thought which the spirit lets fall into it. The illusion is never in the thing, but in the way we look at it. So that's kind of a challenge. That's what we, we do a whole talk about that, could we? It's impersonal because once again, it's not been brought into form yet. It's what is not of its own person yet. It's feminine because, as I said before, it receives um, um, our thoughts and then acts upon them. It's neutral because it can't decide whether it's going to do that or not. It's plastic because it's, it can't be ever changing. And as we release energy into it, it takes that energy and then acts with it. And so it can constantly can change. And Maya is basically the same idea of illusion of mind. The blind, uh, the left side, the blind force of law. Law is blind. It's not like um, legal law that makes an opinion, tells, tells us what we have to do, like speed limits and so on. It's a law like laws of nature. And it's a blind force because it doesn't care who you are. If you step off a building, you're going to fall because it's a law of nature. It's not knowing. It's only doing. It doesn't really know what it's doing, but it knows how to do it. That's kind of tricky. It's a medium of all thought, power, and action. It says cinema pictures. Cinema pictures is whatever we think about, we bring about. And whatever we tend to think about, we actually move into experiencing it, and it happens through the creative medium, which is where we are right now. And it also reasons deductively for exactly the same reasons as um, spirit does. It's passive and receptive. It must receive that which we put into it, and it can't contradict it. And it can't uh, negate it. It can't tell us that's not a very good idea. It simply does as we, it is told. So therefore, it's karmic law on the right side. Karmic law means um, what you put into the universe, you're going to get back out of it. So if you have negative energy that you're putting in the universe, you're going to have negative experiences of the same with positive. It's known as the servant of the eternal spirit throughout the ages. It is the servant. Now, this is the part of God which is the servant of spirit. And if we are connected with spirit, we are one with spirit, 
that means it is our tool. It's the servant of our thoughts and must respond accordingly to how we think. That's a pretty powerful statement, isn't it? Because we, do this, we use this process exactly the same way that God does. Now we're moving into the bottom section, which is the manifestation part, the body part. The top part is the causes. That God is the first cause, and this is effect. So there are causes that are placed into the law, and they return to us as effects, or form, or objective idea. We have the objective state, which is thought-oriented. We have the objective side, subjects or objects, actual physical forms. So it's objective, meaning it actually shows up in form. Conditions or circumstances are also um, manifestations. So things don't have to be in physical form to be manifestation. Thoughts that turn into conditions in our lives are also um, effects, are results. Time and space are limited. Time and space have beginnings and endings. And so therefore they fall in the area of effects. And things, once again, things are defined objects. And so therefore they have a beginning and an end. Their place stops where another one begins. And so therefore they are effects in the world. On the left side it says reflection. That is the idea that how you think shows up in your life, is out pictured in your life. So it's reflected back to you. The illusion of matter is the idea that we know that everything is energy, although it is held together by consciousness, um, so that it's kind of an illusion. It really is just energy, but to us it appears to be matter. Multiplicity and the many are in the body. Remember, God is all that is, it's all just one thing, but the microcosm of many little pieces are in the, are in the, the body. The relative mirror, once again, that's just the same as the reflection. Um, what you think about, you bring about, and you can, what you think about, you can actually see in your environment around you. And emanation is basically just another word for manifestation. Is that all that clear? <laughs> Told you a lot of words. <laughs> this is basically what Deborah just talked about a little bit ago. Uh, this chart shows the universal spirit and then the universal soul, or sub subjectivity, and then the medium, the medium of thought and the power of action, and then the particularization or manifestation of spirit. The point drawn down in the center, as Deborah described, is descent of spirit into matter or form. It is necessary that spirit be manifested in order to express itself. The word unity on the descending line shows that all come from the one, everything that is in manifest form comes from the one essence of all that is. Man reenacts the whole universal life and his nature is identified with spirit. What is true of the whole is true with any one of its undivided parts. Undivided parts. What is true of the whole is true of any one of its undivided parts. Man comes to a point of individualization in the whole and is subject to the law of the whole. So we work exactly the same way that God does in terms of creativity. Number three. Oh, more words. This chart shows how man reenacts the whole and is a subject to the law of his own being. Man thinks consciously and his conscious thought becomes the law of his life. The upper section stands for the self-conscious man and the middle section stands for the subconscious man and the lower section stands for the man as he appears in the flesh and in the conditions of his life. Now we know, as we are spiritual beings who through this physical experience, it's easy for us to see everything in form, but it's maybe not so easy for us to understand ourselves in those top two sections. So this is very valuable to look at. So in the spirit, in our spiritual nature, there's the term Christ Logos, which is basically what we call Christ Consciousness. We know that's a place where we con where we connect with the spiritual nature of who we are. And uh, Ernest Holmes quite often describes this as the sonship, the Father and the Son. We are sons of the Father, but we are made of the Father, and so therefore we are in relationship with as one. We are the microcosm within the macrocosm of all that God is. Emmanuel, the word Emmanuel actually means God with us, or God in us, or God as us. We have a personality, and we have an individuality, but that personality and individuality is an expression 
of the divine because it is God expressing through us. So therefore, it is actually spirit moving through and as us. So that's what that individuality and personality mean. It's a conscious state, it's a mental and spiritual state, and we can reason both inductively and deductively. We can reason inductively either correctly or incorrectly, or we can reason deductively. And so that's a little bit different than from the realm of God, which can only reason deductively. It's also the, uh, the realm of intellect, the divine realm of uh, divine intelligence, purpose, which is our intention, and decision, because we can actually make decisions. We can choose from the infinite realm of possibilities and place them into the law and see them manifest. It's a place where there is will, choice, and volition. Now this will can mean that we actually put the system through the process intentionally, and we can actually choose individual ideas, and we have volition because we can actually be the creator of our own destiny. The soul, the middle section, is subjective, it means it's unconscious. It's our thought processes, it's not our physical energy. It's subconscious, it's unconscious. It's the stuff that um, we think about in the back of our mind that we may not even be aware of. But it, it also is consciousness. So all of it is, is involved in consciousness. It is karma because it, what we think about, we bring about and we experience. And it is aura because it's in us, through us, and as us. It's uh, the memory, the conflict, the psyche, the inherent tendencies, the race suggestions, the prenatal conditions, the images of thought. All of those things are things that influence the law, and they're unconscious to us in most cases until we actually experience this. Remember, Ernest Holmes says our unconscious thoughts are quite often more powerful than our conscious thoughts because 99% of our thoughts are actually unconscious. Auto-suggestion means making suggestions to the self, and Ernest Holmes uh, defines it as expectant belief, which is very powerful. And it reasons deductively only for the same reason we talked about that part before. The bottom is the, spot, uh, the section of the body, or the effects as we experience them. It's our affairs in our life, because we what we thought about has brought those affairs into our reality. Um, it's conditions or circumstances, once again, as we talked about earlier, it's the results. Here's interesting, it's either health or disease, depending on how you think about it. If you have unhealthy thoughts, you're going to experience an unhealthy life. And if you think um, health, you're going to uh, create the, the healthy life. It's a destiny because what we think about, we bring about, and so therefore, we're creating our own destiny. Um, riches and poverty falls in the same thing as health and disease. If you think rich, you're going to get rich. If you think poverty, you're going to stay poverty. Um, it, and it plays out in all of our business, vocation, profession, occupation, and so on, and all the aspects of our lives, all the affairs of our life, will be affected by what we think about. It uh, has no reason, because once something becomes matter or form, it has no opinion anymore, because it can no longer grow from that point on. It, is, it has its limitations. A lot of stuff there, huh? Come to the class. <laughs> the next one is the, um, the metaphysical chart. For, it says the upper section of this chart shows how the conscious mind or spirit of man reflects or contemplates itself. You know that God uh, creates through self-contemplation. But that is exactly the same thing that happens for us. So this is talking about how we reflect or self-contemplate through the medium of the soul or subjectivity into form or matter. The middle section represents the subjectivity, the mirror of mind and unformed matter, the servant of the spirit, and the lower section shows the result of self-contemplation as it takes form in the world of matter. And so this is pretty well self-explanatory, I think. Basically, Deborah described this earlier, um, this the idea we think thoughts, we, we drop them into the, the subjective medium, and then they become um, particularizations to become form or matter or body. In the class, I would say, are there any questions on that? But we're going to go on. We have one. This is number five. This is how ideas manifest as things. This chart is divided into two sides, presenting the world of thought and the world of reflections. 
It represents the law of cause and effect. The world of thought is the world of ideas, while the world of reflections means the results of thought. The world of reflections is entirely a world of effects and is, of itself, unconscious and unknowing. Consider everything on the left side of this chart to be thoughts or ideas, and consider everything on the right side to be automatic results of the law as it works out into effects. So we have on the left side the world of thought. We know that thoughts become conditions. We know that cause creates an effect. We know that belief causes the correspondence between us and the infinite realm of possibilities. We know that every image that we picture in our mind is mirrored back to us in reality. We know that a seed, seed planted in the soil becomes a plant. We know that limited thought creates poverty. Uh, free thought creates wealth. Acceptance creates opportunity. When we think peacefully, we, we experience peace. When we, we, when we think in terms of prayer, we receive an answer. Everything which is positive, we receive positively, negatively, and friendship-wise. Whatever thing we picture becomes a thing, and so on and so on and so forth. As we think, so we receive. And this is the last one. This is the mystic's chart and shows how the universal becomes the particularization of itself through man. Man comes to a point in the universal or God and is the idea of God as man. The Father is represented as the whole just back of or above or within man. This is the indwelling God to whom we pray and with whom we talk. We are expressions of the divine. And so we have the triune nature, which is the three different parts, the individual, indivisible whole of which we are part. And so therefore, the absolute is within, the absolute within, which is the relative, the uncreated within, which is the created, the changes within, which is the change, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. We are within the whole, and we are expressions of the whole. So it's God the Father which art in heaven, or God the, the God, um, our Father, which is within each one of us, the sons, the personalities, the individual, individualizations, or just plain man and woman. And that's a whole lot of logical, meaty, thinking stuff. And if you want to learn how to apply it to life, come to that class. And for those of we always are anyway, so keep practicing.